Good evening and welcome to Terrace Talk. I'm Eamon Hickson here with you instead of Tim Moynan up until 8 o'clock this evening. We've lots coming up on the show this evening. We have uh, some uh, int- interviews from the Giorgio Callan event in Castle Island over the weekend. I ventured out to Castle Island where that pitch was named in honour of the late Giorgio Callan. We also chat rugby this evening with Clogland Rugby Club. They're planning to construct a club history with uh, over 112 years of rugby already. Also we've uh, some drivers from the upcoming Rally of the Lakes in studio including John Hickey and Dermot Healy. Also, we chat to the Zimbabwean woman who was awarded Player of the Year in IT Tralee. She took up Gaelic Games this year and uh, she also plays other sports and got the award above in the college recently. She'll be in after seven. Also, we chat to James O'Dowd, who chats about juvenile golfing in Kerry and efforts to encourage younger players into the game. Also, we'll chat a bit about Gaelic football over the weekend. Were you at any of the Kerry Petroleum Championship games over the weekend? I was at the senior club final myself, where Stacks overcame Croaks. Uh, an absolute exhibition of a display by Sean Quilter and obviously Kieran Donahue leading the line there. A great win for Stacks. If uh, if you were at any of the games, give us a text or give us a call. Tonight we'll let you be the analyst on the Gaelic football. So you can text 083 300 3300 or give Jill a call at 066 71 266 now this evening we're going to start with soccer and in recent weeks the FAI and John Delaney have been in the news over the controversy surrounding the former CEO's 100,000 euro loan to the organisation. With journalists, players, officials, uh, politicians and the public weighing in on the debate, it's easy to forget about some of the work that Kerry clubs, along with the help of the FAI, do on an ongoing basis. And at the heart of many clubs, there's usually a man or a woman who has given their time and energy just to help the club and its players. In Castle Island, that man was Georgie O'Callaghan. On Saturday, he got some overdue recognition for his work over the past 40 years. I went to Castle Island on Saturday afternoon, one year on from Georgie's passing, where the new AstroTurf pitch was being named in his memory. I caught up with many people, including Junior Minister Brendan Griffin, FAI President Donald Conway and lifelong friend of Georgie's John O'Regan. But first, I spoke to James O'Callaghan, brother of the late Georgie. I asked him about the time he sought to transfer away from the club that his brother Georgie was managing. That's a long time ago now. Well, I was trying to take over manager that time, but uh, he, w- he wasn't having it. So I said, I'd go to Tralee. So I met John Regan anyway, and uh, I said, John, uh, I'll come in and play with Tralee United. And he's fine, he said. So I went in training, uh, and uh, things were a couple of nights a week. But John was to the, uh, easy to get on with John. And uh, we pa- played a few games. And then I left that John Regan, <laughs> and then I went to Belly Half. <laughs> I played with Belly Half for a while, and uh, we scored, I scored a goal, a penalty, and the ref made me take it again. And I still put the goal to go the wrong way <laughs> the second time. <laughs> so that, that was a great yeah. deal for that. But then again, I managed Castlein Soccer Club, uh, I think it's about a year, and we were playing the game in Tralee, and uh, I took off two of George's best friends. So he walked up to the side and he should not have taken him off. He said they were playing all right. Well, to me, I said they weren't playing all right. So anyway, about two weeks after, he called a meeting. And I was thanked. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> so, by your own brother. Yeah, you, you're gone, he said. So I went for treasurer then. And uh, of course, he'd all his friends work for him. He wouldn't get dead either, he said. <laughs> So he was a tough brother. Oh, he you? was, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was a loving match yesterday. There was Sergeant General and he, John Mitchell, and Donald Flaherty, the bus driver. There was a game on, and there was something else across the way. The three boys went over watching that. They came back anyway. You're sacked, he said. <laughs> sacked the three of them over. So they got up the following morning anyway, and they were in bad form. So Father looked and said, What's wrong, boys? He said, We were sacked by Georgie. <laughs> so father looked and approached George anyway. He said, George, what's this about the boys? Father he said, it's all right, they're back again. <laughs> <laughs> I did the thing, the machine for lining the pitch. He was all, I think it's a match. So he said you couldn't get the machines here, which you could like. Mm. But he, they bought one over and he brought it back and all flat at his bus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for God's sake. Oh, oh, yeah. uh, 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 Jesus, he did a brilliant time with him. Like, mm. He's done a amount of work. He kept at the whole time, and all the young fellas, he had great control over him. Mm. Like cursing and swearing, have that again, now he won't be playing. 
they have fucking done everything he wants them to do. Mm-hmm. And even before any games, they're going out to Manchester, they'd have to go to Mass that morning. Was he very religious? He was, yeah, they have to go to Mass that morning before the thing. So, I was spared and taken early bus there and play. Uh, uh, the train, the early train, the morning, same one, the morning, five o'clock. So I said, look, drive me in. I will, he said. Lad, let's say the railway station, that's 10 euros now, is it? <laughs> so I said, uh, I'm not sure, I don't say, put it in the letter box when I go home. So I leave her. I put it in the letter box anyway, he met me the following. Never give me the dinner. I put it in the letter box, I didn't find it, he said. <laughs> so. Uh, then I said before he got sick, I went up one night to him, I said, uh, you drive me in the morning, say about, we said about half past four. No, he said, I, I'm a bit too tired now, he said, for doing because he was getting sick that time, failing, I suppose. But he never opened his mouth to me about being sick. Mm-hmm. The only time he said anything was saying when the doctor was after seeing him, I said, had the doctor any news for not good, he said. It's the only time he opened his mouth to me about being sick. Mm-hmm. And he uh, was in the hospital, then the father looked and he stayed around for all that week. He came in the morning, he came in at night. And they stay inside in the hospital, they put a tiger in the race to get him, to get him back. Mm. So George hit down his dead in 1946. That was 1940 when he was born. So when well, he was in the coma, they said, so father looked in the big door for him and said, George, he said, you're telling lies about your age. <laughs> oh, geez, like, the stories. But, uh, the best thing I was about him when he sacked me. I tried to get back nowhere. Just he had the power or the vote. <laughs> and what was he like inside at home? Was he was he the boss at home as well? Well, he was living alone, but he was just living alongside yeah. me. But he was living alone. He never he never settled down or anything. But uh, he knew I was smoke. So I, I would say one day before he came in. Uh, he smelled the fags. There was smoke in here. One outside the door. There's no smoke inside here. <laughs> Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, too deadly. But uh, I don't want to give up them dead effects, he said. Because he never smoked or drank yeah. himself. Never. Oh, for God's sake. So, uh, back in the spots in 1968, uh, when I worked in the Hells Girls for 27 years, and George was bringing down new trucks, and it, well, two of us came down the same day with two new trucks. And Jack Ahern, he used to always call me George. Uh-huh. You see, he was getting mixed up. Yeah. So I was down before him, and... Uh, I said to Jack, the truck is down, I'll say, oh, go upstairs and get paid, he said. It's George Redwood, half an hour after, with the other truck. And uh, I was collecting all, said, uh, he said to Jack for that truck, Jesus said, didn't I pay a while ago, you pay me, Tal? He said, it's James, you paid. He, he was victim to two so, of oh, for God's sake. But uh, uh, he put on a great life there. Yeah. Uh, soccer was his life there. Was oh, for God's sake. He was spinning hours above in the old pitch in the milk road. Every old day and night, that caught in the field, lining it and all that. But he had a great life. He and the, uh, but, uh, with all the players and all that, like he'd done a lot for them, killed a lot for the young fellas off the street. Only for that, should, they could be all over the place getting involved in everything. Mm-hmm. But uh, he had great control over them. The, That's what he, the, well, fr- the principal in the ETB said that everyone, no matter what age they are, yeah. they, they, know, they knew him and that, that, they loved him. That, that's right. And uh, there was a fellow telling me there that Master Tant. He had few uh, students, and there was some film that he couldn't control of do anything with him. So he met Georgie. He said, well, look, take them for a week. Georgie took them for a week or two, and they were thinking uh, they went back anywhere. And he said to John, to the best days work I ever do, he said, they'd do anything for me now. <laughs> That's the control he'd over him. And, and how did he have that control? I, I don't know, and then God. But yeah, he, he whatever they, like, they, w- they wouldn't go against him. Mm. They do wh- what he oh, tell him. That was it. That was his law, and that's it. But uh, there was a uh, when he was playing a game. There was a referee, and uh, they had the game nearly won anyway. And the referee gave a penalty, mm. so they lost the game. He was after taking the referee to the game because the referee knew where going. So the game was over. He left the referee walking home. <laughs> There was another ref then. He might make bad decisions, like, and George is shoved from the sideline, you're a GRF. And he'll be like, I'm not a GRF, he said. <laughs> oh, was a deadly crack. He was a rogue. A rogue, is right. But uh, he was uh, out the sideline then, and one referee said to him, George, I'll give it a red card. <laughs> 
so George came down the left yeah. a bit, but he had a great track with him though, yeah. and that was, the, that was his life, like, mm. so he had nothing, he never mattered, and then like that, he spent his whole life at the soccer, mm. oh for God's sake, blue star. And he was telling me to give up them long journeys, but that was only, we say, a couple of months before he died, but uh, he was at the hospital anyway, and uh, he, I went in about, maybe a week or two before he died, and he said, I said, yeah, how lucky, I'd be going home in a week, he said. He thought he was coming home, they say. Yeah. So I went into the palliative care then, and uh, I was inside the night, and he lost it to me, he had much time left now, she said. And uh, I said, and I, I'd run home, so I'd, and, uh, but that was about half one. So I said, I'd be in again at two o'clock. And just five past two, I came and he was gone then, before, just before I uh, walking in the door. But uh, he had a great life, and if he was here today, he'd be proud of that. But it was some John Delaney, were great friends. Yeah. We were outstanding friends all together. Mm-hmm. So it's a pity he isn't here today, but I was, don't you know, now, yeah. I was because too much has to do now, and yeah, right. time might have been worked out all right the way it was. But, uh, Everyone in Kerry Soccer knew him. Oh, they did. Oh, jeez, I know. Sure, they, I, I met uh, managers there now when uh, clubs I got to there with games. Mm. And they it's a hello, George. <laughs> they, they just for, they forget this. You're still eh? taking credit for him. <laughs> what what, what, what is this, eh? But, uh, I it's, oh, jeez, sorry. I, 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 but I was walking into one field anyway, or into John Reagan's KDL inside, and the man would be inside with him. I don't know his name now, Seven Belly Higgs from Plus. The first time you see me, it was a long time. Jesus Christ, I said, you're, you're frightened. He said, oh, means I, I was full sure. He said to George, you come out of that car. I just jacked it all on me. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, guys, I'll be talking about it. But uh, it was a great day, and it was a great end up for him, like that he has to see this pitch develop. Mm-hmm. Uh, he put a lot of work into it, like that. Oh, Jesus. He kept all the places he tried for pitches and mm-hmm. pitches, like across the road there and on the old presidency. I was playing there for years. Mm-hmm. That's what I was. And. Uh, but James, he'd be under pressure here. I know he was a man for keeping oh, the sidelines marked, the grass cut, but it's oh, an astro, he'd have no grass to cut. No grass to cut at all. I'd say he wouldn't like that. <laughs> he'd have little to do. <laughs> oh, but I still have the, I, I still line the old pitch board on the Limerick Road. Mm. They'll probably keep on to that for another while. No, no, because there would have a lot of games here and they could go up training there. Mm. But uh, I was, I went to one man to line it with him. No, no, go away. He said, do not put that dead line is crooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a bit quicker that yeah, way. So he was right. And yeah. uh, he stood below. Nah, tap, put away the thing. I do it myself. <laughs> oh, jeez. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. A fitting tribute to have this uh, wonderful facility oh, in that. Oh, it is great. It is a great art again. And the day turned out lovely for his adventure. And if you show what the crowd is there, like, to, to massive art together. But uh, they loved him. The people loved him around. He was collecting lots of new players and bring him here and take him home again, even after training. But, uh, There'd be nothing here without him, really. Oh, Jesus. No, no, no. Like, it was a lifetime to, to achieve all that. And all the English talked England. They're like, to maybe twenty or thirty together. Mm. That was a big responsibility to take them over mm. there, like, to keep them in line and look after, because they, they wouldn't step out of line. Yeah. They, they knew what happened if they, if they did. But it was a long time, like 45 years. That's what it was. Mm. Massive time. Mm. That's, that's and uh, you miss them, Jamesy? I would, yeah. You, you miss them, of course. You would, have. Uh, but uh, mm. the only time we had one fun was when I got sacked. <laughs> I'd talk to about a week after. <laughs> I did hit, sir. Uh, What's we doing tomorrow? I say, I won't be doing too much. Uh, I've shopped a bit of transport, I have a few players to take the match. I say, will I get paid for that? Who will not ask it? It's in the letterbox. It's in the letterbox, but that was good. Oh, geez, it's not. But, uh, you start with, say, 10 euros now. But I will, I will just give it from time to time. Yeah. But, uh, the letterbox, no, no, he said, I was not in the letterbox. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Yeah, I was thinking that. Oh, but but uh, oh, I would miss him all right. That's what we would have. Mm-hmm. We were together for so we were next door to each other for years and years and years. But uh, and I was I was player here then, uh, oh. manager player then. Uh, he said uh, I remember the songs. Uh, am I getting any game? <laughs> I don't think it was fit enough. I said to train the last night so you won't pull your weight. And he said. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but I got the draw from him anyway. Yeah, oh, I different. Oh, jeez. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Because we were doing well. And, uh, and would he have been laughing about it at the time or would he have taken it seriously? Oh, he'd, he'd, he'd take it serious. He'd, 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 he'd said, that's it. 
But that was over putting off his two friends. You see, probably that was a boat yeah. and they voted with him. He was a, he was a loyal guy. A oh, loyal guy, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. They said, oh, God, oh, God, that's it. That will not, that will not come back. Oh, God. Uh, James, yeah. thank you so much. That okay, was thank, you, thank you too. And that was James O'Callaghan, brother of the late Georgie, uh, who I met out in Castle Island on Saturday. We'll have more after this short break, but uh, staying with soccer for a moment, and there's good news for Kerry soccer fans and even uh, Alna Skoll soccer fans. Young Sean Kennedy, who plays with Sunderland, he would have been a cousin of, uh, is a cousin of Tommy Doyle's. He's been selected for the Republic of Ireland Under-17 team for the UEFA European Under-17 Championships, which kicks off uh, later on this week, actually, above in Dublin. So some good news for Kerry soccer fans. We'll have more from Castle Island after the short break. From the sidelines to the stand, Terrace Talk on Radio Kerry. Hello, welcome back to Terrace Talk. I'm Eamon Hicks, and if you want to get in touch tonight, give us a call 066 712 or text or WhatsApp 083 300 3300. Now, we're continuing with the tribute to the late Giorgio Callaghan. Now, I was in Castle Island on Saturday and spoke to many people during the naming of the pitch after the late Georgie, including Kerry's junior sports minister, the president of the FAI, and uh, Theresa Lonergan, principal of the local ETB. I also spoke to John O'Regan, secretary of the Kerry District League, who was a lifelong friend of Georgie's. I first asked John, what was Georgie like? Well, Georgie was, uh, first of all, Georgie was a Castle Island to the core. Mm. Uh, everything had to be about Castle Island. He, he, was, he was a great man for, for the Castle Island uh, AFC. <coughs> Starting with, he started with the school boys. And, but for one, for one or two years there, he, well, he, he ran a B team well. in Castle Island. Oh, yeah. And his brother James, he was playing on the B team. And, Mas, and Massey Miguel, he was playing on the B team. And um, Georgie was the manager, so there was some bit of a, a bit of a row one evening anyway between Georgie and uh, and uh, James. A. And uh, the following morning, James and Mossy Miguel arrived into my house in Small Road, uh, wanting to know had I two transfers. <laughs> so I said, "What are the transfers for?" So I said, uh, "He said, well, we, we can't put up with him anymore. We we want to we want to change with." So they arrived in anyway, and they played two weeks with Sir United B, and. Uh, the next thing, James A. Uh, arrived in one morning, the following Monday morning, arrived in, he said to John, he says, can I have two more transfers? I said, what's, what's happening now? So he said, he won't talk to me at home because I, uh, that I'm playing with you, so I have to transfer back to Castle Island. <laughs> and that was the end of the, the, Edmund Hartley said there earlier on today, he said, uh, uh, it is great to see two truly united men standing together. <laughs> James A. James A. said, yeah, we were... We were we were comrades in arms at one stage, all right. Uh, how was Georgie? How was he as a player? How was he as a manager? Was he I suppose use? Georgie was... Well, he was fantastic as a manager, to be, to be honest about it. He was fantastic with kids. And, uh, you know, I think Father Upton put a little bit in his program, the programme there about how he could get the best out of people. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and he, he could give out to people. Yeah. But he still maintained a bit of control over everybody that he, that he dealt with. And, he, and like the one thing about Georgie, he always thought, he always, uh, you know, had great respect for everybody, mm. uh, even though he might be... Uh, Georgie played uh, a, a lot of people uh, that, you know, might be dodgy enough you know, whether they were underage or <laughs> overage, like, so you, you, you'd, be, you'd be very... He, 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 he's a very of a Georgie team. He used yeah. to have great uh, youths under 17 and, and schoolboy teams. He was fantastic that way. Though, you know. Was he a Manchester United fan? He was a Manchester United fan and Father Upton from Manchester oh, yeah. was a fierce Man City fan. Oh, yeah. And I was just talking to him out, out, out there when it was all over. When he, you know, he said, uh, God bless the pitch and God bless everything and, and God bless Man City and hope that they win the <laughs> Premier League. So, you know, but... Uh, uh, Father Upton, like, was uh, I was just telling Father Upton the story about the morning that Georgie rang me. That had been three games on in the uh, pitch uh, next to the presbytery mm-hmm. out there, and uh, uh, on the Saturday, three, three school by games, and so on the Sunday morning, it, Georgie rang me and he said, "John," he said, uh, "You know," he said, the, "The pitch is unplayable. There'll be no game here today." So. Uh, he said, the cannon said there's going to be no game here today, John. And uh, I said, get the cannon to ring me. <laughs> so he said, there's no need of that, John. He says, the cannon is here. I'm going to talk to him. So the cannon oh, got on to me. And, uh, you know, he said, John, I, have a, I had a lovely green pitch yesterday morning. I have a brown pitch today. 
So I said, okay, Karen, and he won that he won that battle, you know. So oh. that was it. But uh, there was another time he was caught in the pitch, and uh, and uh, John Delaney rang him, and uh, John, John John says to him, Georgie, what are you doing? So he says. I'm cutting a pitch here, he says, with a hand lawnmower, he says. And at the time, John was after getting an apology from one of the, the national newspapers for, for um, you know, for some yeah, bits and pieces yeah. that went on. So, uh, so, so John said, you cut it with a hand lawnmower, he said, and you don't have any ride on or anything like that. So John just said, no, he says. Well, so John said, uh, we'll have to put that right anyway. So he was just finishing up negotiations with the, the newspaper involved. And uh, the, he, he got his apology, and the boys from the newspaper said, "Well, that's grand. Now everything is finished." Well, not really," says John. "We have one small little bit of business to to attend to." So, uh, oh, what's that? So, oh, so they said, "Look, there's a man by the name of George O'Callaghan down in Castle Island. He's cutting a soccer pitch with a hand lawnmower. He needs a ride on lawnmower. Will you buy a ride on lawnmower for George?" And it was agreed then that they'd buy the light on, right on lawnmower for Georgia. Georgia got his lawnmower the following week, <laughs> and he had it to the day he passed away. Uh, you know, but he got that lawnmower, <laughs> and he was he was the, he was the king. He'd leave nobody else use it. Yeah. The boys with the, in the senior pitch wouldn't even be left to use it. He used it for his own pitch. That was it, and he wouldn't use it for any other pitch. Like, but that's that's the story of Georgie With the, mm. he, he was a driving force behind the club in every respect. Oh my God, he was. He was like I mean, I, I was often at home. It was, it was Sunday, uh, Monday morning, like and you know, might be feeling too well. Mm. The next thing, uh, the doorbell would ring. John, uh, have you two match balls? The other, next week it might be two training balls. But he'd always call, to be fair to him, like, you know, he'd always call and he'd always get the match balls and the training balls and, you know, the bibs and stuff off, off, of, off of myself through the Kelly District League. Like. What would he have made of today's fuss naming the pitch after him? Well, I suppose, you know, being the kind of a fella he was, I don't think that he, you know, that, that he, if he was alive, he, he, he wouldn't want it, you know, and, uh, but, uh, I, I, I think you know it, it was a great, it was a great uh, thing by the the club uh, and the sc- and the school, of course. Mm. That they were, of course, he spent a lot of time here in, in the school. Like mm. he spent a lot of time in here, uh, taking mm-hmm. young fellas on the bus, you know, driving the bus and taking young fellas to uh, matches, uh, school matches, and uh, you know. So, uh, but uh, Georgie, Georgie would would have been uh, a lovely fella and. Uh, I had taskmaster to be honest about it, uh, but I found him to be one of the most honest fellows you know you, you'd ever deal with. You could trust him like that if he owed you ten cent for a match ball or anything like that, you'd get it. And that was it. But he was. You were good friends. Uh, how much did you miss him? I always miss George. I, I mean, I, 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 you know, as I said, I, I, I miss those, those at least weekly uh, visits that he'd be called to the house and he'd come in and. He'd sit down, he'd have a cup of tea, and you know he'd be off out the door again, you know. But uh, uh, he, you'd miss Georgie, and I think everybody in Castle Island would miss Georgie. Um, my uh, my own brother Dennis, who died very young, uh, you know, with uh, diabetes, uh, he was married to uh, Georgie's niece right. Kathleen Shukru here in here in Castle Island. Uh, my nephew Michael O'Regan is living in Castle Island, so I would have a. a, 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 a George's, George's sister Hannah O'Callaghan uh, Mrs Shukro she was a fantastic woman mm-hmm. you know and I'd have a bit of a tie with Castle Island through that you know yeah. so uh, t- I came out here today now and my nephew was here Michael and you know there was Michael Shukro was here and you know all that family like so I would have mm. I would have family ties here as well and so it's uh, very fitting that such a beautiful pitch has been named after the late George O'Callaghan it is. It's, it's absolutely. F- I'm delighted and, and thrilled that, that you know they saw fit to, to name it after. I don't think they could have named it after anybody else. Mm-hmm. And if you walk out there now today, you'll see his brother James. They're a spitting image <laughs> of each other. And there was somebody talking to me there early on, and they turned around and they said, "Is that Georgie?" I said, "No, that's his brother James." 
And that was John O'Regan, a good friend of the late Georgie O'Callaghan, Texas, coming in here. Uh, lovely to hear James O'Callaghan speaking about the late George. He was always such a gentleman, two gas men, great friends of my late Ed Fodder, and that's from a soccer fan in the county. It's a wonderful tribute to Georgie O'Callaghan of the pitch named after him. It was a pity the mess the, in the FAI happened at the same time as the naming, and that comes from Charles. Hi, Eamon, well done on your tribute to Georgie O'Callaghan. What he did for soccer in Kerry will never be repeated, plus the number of kids who have never seen the Republic of Ireland without Georgie it would be huge. The pitch is a fitting tribute to him and the club and committee deserve huge credit for what they've achieved. That's Padre Carnet, Kerry Schoolboys and Girl Chair. Now, just before we take a quick break, if you want to get in touch, 083 300 300, call 066 712 366 or find us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, were you at any of the Kerry Petroleum Championship semi-finals or the final over the weekend? Like I said earlier, I was at the Stacks and Crokes game. Stacks uh, won that one by six points and uh, put me thinking, have us and Stacks ended Crokes dominance? Or is it just a blip from the reigning Kerry Senior Football Champions and the Munster Champions and uh, losing all Ireland finalists? Anyway, we have plenty more after this short break. Terrace Talk on Radio Kerry. Brought to you in association with BrianJames.ie. Leading the way for stylish menswear in Kerry. Welcome back to Terrace Talk. Eamon Hickson here with you up until 8 o'clock this evening. Coming up on the show shortly, we talk rugby with Kilorglin Rugby Club. We're also on about the rally, which is coming up over the weekend, the Rally of the Lakes. There's Gaelic football and golf before 8 o'clock. And now, just going back to Castle Island, I was out there on Saturday for the naming of the pitch after late Giorgio Callan. I caught up with a number of people, including the FAI President, Donald Conway. But first, uh, Minister Brennan Griffin. I asked the Minister of State at the Department of Tourism, Transport and Sport before he talked out asking him about the importance of Giorgio Callan Park. So here with Minister of State at the Department of Tourism, Transport and Sport, Brendan Griffin. Brendan, during the official uh, ribbon cutting there, we, all of us were looking around and I hear that you're tagging out and you're getting to play in this new pitch, the Giorgio Callaghan Park. I am I'm re- very much looking forward to participating in the game today. Uh, I've played in Castle Island previously in the Limerick Road pitch when I was playing with Main Bank, uh, but uh, nothing next to near like the facility that we have here today. So really looking forward to being part of it and I don't think I'll be uh, influencing the game that much but uh, it is uh, a privilege to be, be able to play on the pitch today on this special occasion but also as well with so many of the former Republic of Ireland legends as well who've joined us here today for the occasion. And Brendan you were standing on that two years ago you were junior minister for a matter of days and I think uh, Bobby O'Connell brought you out to look at the place a lot has changed since then. Yeah Bobby brought me down within five days I think of becoming the minister to see the facility and to see uh, what was needed here and thankfully we were able to contribute 59,000 Euro through the Sports Capital Programme in collaboration of course with funding from the FAI, from Kerry ETB and of course the huge effort that was made by Castle Island AFC here in the community to raise funding to put all that money together and to build this very lasting and fitting tribute to the late George O'Callaghan who was an amazing, amazing sportsman and an amazing soccer supporter here in Castle Island who did great work for the development of the game and the development of sport in general for Castle Island. And you even saw that today, there are hundreds of people here from all ages and all here to remember Georgie. Absolutely, I think it says an awful lot about the man who he was that so many people came out here to honour him today and to remember him in such a positive way and this is going to be here forevermore in honour of Georgie and and uh, he'll never be forgotten and I think it's lovely for his family today to see uh, such a brilliant coming together of the community in his honour. And the community and even the sports capital grants, yes, they helped a lot, but the FAI have helped a lot and get this pitch here. And over the past few months, there has been some controversy, but the president of the FAI, Donald Conway, is here today and he received a good reception. He did, and rightly so. The FAI have contributed to this project as well. Uh, George O'Callaghan spearheaded with the chairman, Pao Rourke, uh, the efforts with the FAI to secure financial assistance uh, as part of the collaboration between a number of different agencies, including our own department, to put the funding together and uh, so it's only right that they would be here today and they would be acknowledged for their contribution as well and I think they held Georgie in very very high esteem and uh, certainly Georgie's input uh, would have been enormous in terms of securing that funding from the the FAI and uh, it's um, important that everyone who plays a role uh, is acknowledged here today and I think also as well this can be seen as a beacon for other communities and to show how when you work together when you bring different people together agencies together make an effort a collective effort you can produce outstanding results and what we have here today is an outstanding result in a top class state of the art modern facility which will be here for many many decades to come. A man that a lot of people were probably coming today here to see him 
Uh, he wasn't here. He didn't get the mother of all welcomes, and that's John Delaney. As I said, uh, Donald Conway came to represent the FAI. In recent months, how do you think Kerry public representatives have fared in relation to the, the controversy at the FAI? Well, I think first of all, again today, it should always have been about Georgie O'Callaghan and I think it was a terrible pity and a shame that some of the commentary has tainted uh, this development and this facility and this day, this day should always have been about Georgie and should never have been about anybody else and I think the commentary of some representatives uh, which jeopardised that uh, was, um, I think it was it was very unfortunate. Um, but again, I think the people today have proven and have shown that um, they acknowledge one of their own as, as being an outstanding uh, contributor to sport and they're honouring him here today and that's what it should be about. And, you know, in terms of what, what I think about the conduct of other public representatives, ultimately it's the people of Kerry who will decide on that and I leave that to the people of Kerry to decide in the future what they think is fitting um, conduct or what isn't fitting conduct. And the people of Kerry and maybe nationally, there were some supporting what our public representative said and some were against it, but even before we were here today renaming the pitch in honour of Georgia Callan, there was a lot of controversy. So Kerry's public representatives, should they have been united on, on one front? Um, my role as the minister in the department is to ensure that we have due process in terms of any controversies or any investigations and to work with our partners in Sport Ireland and our national governing bodies of sport for the betterment of sport in the country. And when I talk about due process, I think it's critical that for me uh, to reserve any particular comment about any particular individuals or organisations until we see the full facts. As we know in relation to the FAI, there are a number of investigations going on at present. Uh, when we have full facts, we'll be able to comment further and I'll be able to make full judgment in relation to uh, what is, is or isn't the case. But again, as I said, in terms of other public representatives, they're free to say what they want to say in committee and when they have the all privilege. Um, but I think it's a pity that this project and this collaboration uh, was somewhat tainted by some of the commentary um, somehow indicating that there was something underhanded or that there was um, you know some sort of a, um, a nod and wink culture when actually what it was was a very very strong collaboration between a number of partners um, that resulted in a fine facility for the people of Castle Island it shouldn't be tainted uh, it was a legitimate uh, collaboration between partners and uh, anyone who suggested otherwise uh, through their commentary uh, or tried to in, in any way um, and become associated with a project I think was being grossly irresponsible and very disrespectful to the club here. A lot has been said that if funding is withheld to the FAI, whether it be through Sport Ireland or through the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport, that it's the grassroots that will be affected. And here we are today, Brendan, we're seeing hundreds of, of people here, uh, over 200 kids kicking on this field. Will it be very hard if these reviews come out and maybe don't shine on the FAI in a very positive light? Will it be hard for you as Junior Minister with the responsibility for the sports capital grants to, diff to, to keep that apart, keep the emotion out of it? Well, what I've made very clear uh, throughout this process and from the very beginning is that any withdrawal of funding uh, in relation to the sports capital program uh, will not affect local clubs. So any local clubs like Castle Island, AFC, who secured funding in our last round and who are currently in for further funding for the changing rooms for this facility, they won't be affected in any way regardless of what happens. Uh, what we are saying is that you know the larger uh, infrastructural projects that are applied for directly by the FAI uh, that even though allocations may be made, drawdown of funding uh, may be suspended or delayed until such a time as there's full and proper governance uh, clearly in place in the organisation and that all of the questions that are currently being asked are answered. But when that happens, uh, obviously we will then be in a position to release any allocated funding. But my primary objective is to ensure that the people at grassroots soccer level, the boys and girls, uh, the men and women around the country who participate in soccer uh, on a weekly basis, on a, in some cases on a daily basis, Basis, uh, that they continue to be able to play the, the game that they, that they love, to, they continue to be able to, um, to exercise and have recreation through soccer and that's something I'm very passionate about as someone who's played soccer for years, uh, who loves playing soccer, uh, I want to ensure that everyone who wants to play soccer will be able to play soccer and won't be adversely affected by this. And uh, finally Brendan, just getting back to the soccer you mentioned, 
was it yesterday, 30 years ago, that Ireland started a run of five games that led to Italia 90? That's right. Um, I think it was a Michelle own goal in Dublin that led to that 1 0 win over Spain. Uh, we'd started off with a relatively poor start to the qualifying campaign with um, a draw away to Northern Ireland and a draw away to Hungary and we lost away to Spain. But after that win at home, uh, we went and beat Malta at home, beat Hungary at home, and also then beat Northern Ireland at home, and finally beat Malta in that famous game, Valletta 2-0 to qualify for Italia 90. And as I said today, not only did it inspire the future uh, generations of sports people, it inspired the whole nation at the time and gave Ireland a massive lift at what was quite a dark time in our history. Uh, the troubles in Northern Ireland in particular and the economy uh, were in serious difficulty. And that qualification process on top of Euro 88 which happened two years earlier I think really lifted the spirit of the country and that's the power of sport it can lift communities it can lift nations and we saw that as an example in 1990 and so it's great to have so many of those participants in that team and that squad that famous Italian 90 squad here with us in Castle Island today as a tribute to Giorgio Callaghan I think it's really really fitting and Rinan you're going to go try inspire some of the kids there later on you're tugging off to take part uh, I don't think it'll be inspirational stuff I think, uh, I think it could be horrific stuff I think when they're trying to clear the crowd at the end of the game they're going to bring me on for impact so Brendan thanks so much thanks David so here with the president of the FAI Donald Conway so uh, Donald while you didn't know Georgie very well you, you knew of him and you, you I know you think you made an award to him a while back a couple of years ago but uh, you also knew you've been chatting to people about Georgie and about his memory absolutely uh, from the time we arrived down here today uh, members of the club visitors from the UK who are speaking here now at the moment and about not just his service to the club but the travels to Manchester the children being brought across the Manchester and then the groups from England coming here which football is fantastic but that opens up then other possibilities and other experiences for these young people and he did this year after year after year from what I hear you know and as I said earlier 45 years co-founder of the club 45 years centrally involved in the generation of this project here today uh, which is a huge credit to him I suppose in over the past few months the FAI has been in the spotlight but you have received a lot of backing from the grassroots and a lot of backing from places like County Kerry how do you feel about that? Football goes on uh, I've been at three matches this week myself for example whether it's League of Ireland underage internationals whatever so whatever about the issues that are there at the moment football doesn't stop the FEI is an association with 200 employees does what it does day in and day out and all of that continues and I think that's understood and appreciated right throughout the game at grassroots level and those ongoing efforts are supported and endorsed. And this morning Donald uh, it was announced between the FAI and Sport Ireland that the terms of a review and a governance group have been set up. Can you give us a little outline of that? There's a five member governance review group uh, Sport Ireland has appointed three of the five and one of the Sport Ireland nominees chairs the group. The terms of reference have been set uh, and agreed with Sport Ireland and indeed we've also notified UEFA who would be a huge stakeholder from our point of view. They're aware of what the terms of reference are. So it's to implement new structures. It's to bring the organisation to a place that allows it to flourish that makes it a top-class organisation. There are guidelines there, as we know, that were issued by the government in 2016 for voluntary bodies, clubs and so forth. Uh, guidelines on good governance. We've implemented some, but we now want to take it uh, forward in a very, very significant way. So that be it at board level or at committee level, our procedures and processes within the FEI are all carried out to the highest standard. The findings of this governance group and even maybe I suppose the last couple of months, do you think the reputation of the FAI has been damaged irreparably? Certainly not damaged irreparably, certainly not. Um, we have issues that we have to deal with, we have to be seen to deal with and we have to earn credibility as time goes by that there is a real reform agenda. Um, our last major root and branch review, a review was in 2002, 2003. So look, that's 16, 17 years. So a review now is long overdue. Um, and that is the way now. Governance is changing. Uh, guidelines and governance are changing. 
So um, we're serious about it and we're putting a reform agenda in place. You said the last big review was 2000, 2003. In that time, were there any proposals maybe within the FAI to say we need to maybe get an outside look, get an independent look at ourselves, or was it all kept, kept in within the board and within the FAI itself? There were a series of recommendations in that review. I remember it well. I was involved with it. Uh, a series of recommendations at that time. And, you know, that idea of having a board that's a skills or competency-based board, having a board to run the organisation that has external uh, skill sets on it, all of that we're very open to. All of that, uh, I don't want to be prejudging what the Governance mm. Review Group yeah, reports, but, you know, I think for any major sporting organisation, I think that's the way they would be looking at governance, governance going forward. Absolutely. President of the FAI, Donald Conway, thank you very much. Yeah, that was Donald Conway and earlier uh, Minister of State uh, Brendan Griffin out in Castle Island at the naming of the pitch in honour of the late uh, Giorgio Callan. Now we're switching on to rugby and Calorglin has a long history with uh, the game of rugby and it's accepted that the original club was founded as early as 1885 although an exact date isn't confirmed. In the early 80, 1880s rugby was a game that was played all over Kerry and Calorglin town was no exception to this. J.P. O'Sullivan was one of the primary figures in Calorglin rugby football club and uh, you know that name J.P. O'Sullivan uh, Park is uh, where Long Rangers play their Gaelic football Moving forward to the current day and rugby is still a big sport in Clorglin and with me here in studio and Tralee to chat about that I have three members of Clorglin Rugby Club with Dave Coffey, Director of Rugby Luke O'Shea, Senior Team Captain and Colm Conway, Club President Guys, you're very welcome to Terrace Talk Thank you, Thank you. So Dave, I'll start with you Director of Rugby with Clorglin Rugby Club I know you're looking forward to celebrating your 20-year history, but rugby, it's been in Cologlin for a very long time, and there's proud traditions. Yeah, it is. Um, <clears throat> I suppose nearly everybody that we played with would have, would have played for Cologlin at some stage. Uh, as we were saying earlier, it uh, started in 1885, and then had hiatus for a while, and then <clears throat> kicked off again in the 70s for a bit, 70s and into the 80s. Um, and then uh, Colin was involved in getting restarted in the late 90s, I played playing the original team that starts back in the in the late 90s, early 90s, uh, along with Cullum and a few more. <coughs> There's not too many of us left now still playing, so I retired last year. And Andrew Riley actually was in the the team. He, We're not sure if he's retired yet. <laughs> he's one of those players. He keeps coming back. Um, <laughs> the, the, the clubs all over, all over the county, all over the country even. Yeah, yeah. But it's been great. I mean, I, I loved them. Made a lot of friends with rugby and I'm still involved now. Like, so <coughs> I think it's very important for the town to have it, like. Uh, President Colm Conway, uh, Dave was saying there that over about 20 years ago, 1999, late 90s, there was a bit of a rejuvenation of rugby in the town. How did that come about again? Uh, it really came about, uh, the club had gone defunct in the 70s um, and uh, rugby was introduced into the intermediate school in Kilorglin by uh, John Healy and Tom Curtain, two stalwarts of the game in Kilorglin. Uh, fir- it was introduced in 1992, um, the senior team in the school then went on to win the uh, West Munster under 18 Cup in 1993 so some of those players had come through so the, the club then uh, formed a senior team in 1999 um, there was enough interest in, in the game in the town um, I suppose we struggled to get a ground we struggled to get, we troubled to get a, a, a set of jerseys even at mm. the start you know because because rugby had gone um, into hibernation within the town it took a while to get it back established but there was a core group of, of players I mentioned Tom and, and John Healy but Andrew Eady, Maddie Foley all those were great stalwarts, Leslie West uh, got the club back up and running and uh, you know we're glad to say that we're, we're going to celebrate 20 years of our refounding uh, this year uh, late in November we hope to have a, an official gathering um, with memorabilia and photographs that we've ha- ha- hopefully held on to over the last number of years. And over the past 20 years years, Cullum, was there a lot of success? Uh, there was, you know, I mean, I suppose we be- we began in 99 just with a senior team, but we then uh, quickly got developed into an under 18, 16, 14s team, and then we we developed minis uh, as well. I suppose the highlight for the senior team was um, winning the uh, J1 Division 3 title um, and being promoted into into uh, Division 2. That was a big highlight, really. Uh, we won a Galway, uh, Galway Foley Cup and that. So there were highlights along the way, and certainly at underage level, 
level. Uh, we won some West Munster Cups. I know Luke was involved in a very successful under-18 team as well in the club. So uh, we, we have had our moments, I suppose. We haven't, you know, <laughs> shot the lights out, but certainly we've held our own and we've slowly progressed from J3 rugby into J2, into J1, up as far as Division 2, and we currently lie uh, in Division 3 at the moment. And uh, Caloraglan, of all the towns in Kerry, there's a very strong Gaelic football clan. There's a number of soccer teams in the area and around. So there's, there is competition for players as well. Absolutely. You know, and I suppose like any rural club, we struggle a little bit, you know, with the senior team and, and the youth team. I suppose we're looking away that maybe at a GA level and that uh, there's a lot of clubs uh, in the local area. But for rugby, I suppose we're pulling from the whole mid Kerry area, really, you know. And, and currently we have amalgamations at under 18 with Killarney and at under 14s with Evra as well this year. So, um, look, we're always looking for more volunteers and more players, but we're not doing too bad at the moment. And Luke O'Shea, senior team captains in studio as well with me. Luke, very welcome. Uh, you've been playing rugby all your life and now you're captain, team captain of the senior side in Kilorglin. When did it all start for you? Um, I suppose it started at under 12 or under 14s um, with Ronan Curtain. Um I was playing football at the time and kind of rugby when I went into the intermediate school kind of there was an opportunity there to play and uh, grasped it with both hands and then Ronan took me under the wing for under 14s and uh, from there just the love grew um, I'm not the biggest man in the world so there was a position there for me on the rugby field at 9 or 10 and kind of settled into that role then and I've been there since Is out half a position where it takes time to bed into you know whether I know there are some more specialist positions but would say the back three is something that most lads could nearly fit into but is out half a position that you need a couple of seasons in to really develop? Um, definitely I suppose you just have to mature into it really it's kind of you're the quarterback in, in a sense so it's up to you to make all the decisions on the field and you kind of you probably need to know the game of rugby as well a lot more than your prop forwards who are just uh, interested in smashing fellas uh, so yeah it, it's just it's one of those positions I suppose you kind of just have to keep your head um, and, but it's very enjoyable and the rewards are brilliant from it like so Are there days where the forwards won't pass the ball back so <laughs> you know, all, all the thinking in the world body out half doesn't come to anything No we're unfortunate in Clargan we have a crowd called the Lynches and none of them know how to pass the rugby ball so uh, yeah pass themselves <laughs> exactly yeah, there are so. a few of those guys around other clubs in exactly, Clargan yeah, they're, they're in every club I think uh, Dave as director of rugby you know we hear this term I suppose in the professional game a lot the director of rugby with different clubs and all that what does a director of rugby entail with Clargan <laughs> probably sounds posher than it is I it suppose sounds very posh. Degree, yeah <laughs> um I mean, it, basically, it it starts off before the season starts to to get everybody in line for for coaches and pick who's doing what teams and to find what teams are short and try and get coaches to do it. And in fairness to everybody that's involved there, <clears throat> they're great. Like the time they give. I mean, we all know in, in all clubs, coaches are are vital. You don't have teams without coaches. Um, <clears throat> so they give their time. I mean, even now they're still going, still going on the fourteens, which is a lot later than we'd hoped for, but. Fair play to Mentally Keller there's in charge, they're still plugging away very hard like so <clears throat> so we gather them gather them then the start of the season and then after that it's a, it's a case of helping out coaches wherever they need to be helped out and get sorted with logistics and stuff. As director of rugby, uh, is it your aim to I suppose instill a style of play or a style of culture in the club or <coughs> is that left down to individual coaches? Well ideally you'd you'd like to put it in. I mean, for instance, it's it's a big issue with um you lo- a lot of time you lose kids and the main reason you lose kids to playing is, is that they're not they're just not getting minutes in the pitch. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so ideally, you'd, you'd like to put it across to, to all the coaches that winning the game isn't what's important. It's if if every kid is playing rugby, that's all, that's really what matters, you know. And again, playing good rugby, <clears throat> I mean, there's a there's actually a great initiative by the by um, at the under fourteen level that they tried out this year, and that you play you play an under fourteen game is three thirds. Mm. So the first two are competitive, and the last third isn't. Yeah. So then you can <clears throat> bring on your players, and at least everybody plays a third of rugby every every week. Then when they have a game, you know. So it's it's great, and they're ideally. If you were talking about trying to bring it to that every player plays a half a game, mm. ideally, or that's probably not practical in a sense. But once they have the plan together, then if you can get coaches to buy into playing people as much as they can and getting them on the pitch, I know it gets tough towards the end of this, particularly towards the end of the season when there's finals and at stake, but. If you can get them playing, mm. it's the best. It's the way you can improve their skills for further on as well, you know. And uh, Colm, in terms of success, I know you're under 14 teams. They're going very well this year. And uh, can you tell us about how they got on so far? Uh, 
Yeah, they've been going pretty well. As I said, we have an amalgamation from um, or with the Evra, and there's a great bunch of lads coming up there. And in fairness to the parents, they're driving them up for training and matches on a regular basis. Uh, they had a great win against Tralee in the Westminster semi final on Saturday. They won by uh, 17 points to 15. So they're in action in the final tomorrow evening in Castle Island at 7 o'clock. Uh, so we wish them the best of luck in that. And hopefully, it will be great to get some silverware at the end of the day because the coaches uh, have put in a great effort. Uh, there's been huge improvements in that team uh, since the beginning of the year so uh, we sh- even though they're playing only what with two days break we wish them all the, the very best tomorrow in Castle Island And Luke I know your season finished a couple of weeks back but tag rugby starts tomorrow for you now being captain of the senior team what are the benefits of playing tag rugby? Uh, definitely it's a great way to ease back into fitness for the season coming our pre-season normally starts um, the end of July start of August so mm. I mean if you're starting now you have two months of running every Wednesday and <laughs> While it's intense, it's not competitive, it's fun, so definitely it's an inclusive sport um, and we'd be encouraging men and women to, to partake in it. <coughs> I think last year we had numbers in around 30 every week and mm. that's great to see and it's great to make new friends and people get to see the Clarkham Rugby Club for what it is and it's great. Yep. And uh, finally, Colm, I know that coming up in November you want to celebrate the 20-year anniversary. Yeah, we're uh, celebrating the anniversary of the refounding of the club, so um, we have a lot of photographs and uh, old memorabilia gathered uh, from the recent history but I suppose I'd like to appeal as well to anybody out there uh, who might have any old photographs um, relating to Glorgan Rugby Club that if we could um, uh, borrow them for that night mm-hmm. uh, they could contact um, anyone in the club through our social media outlets uh, you know and we've had great support in, in the town we have a great functioning committee uh, within the club our coaches and parents have been brilliant to us and our sponsors are very kind to us as well if, if I might like to mention uh, Boyle's Stopline our main sponsor as well so they're great to us uh, and just to mention that the tag rugby starts on Wednesday the 1st of May it's on in the Dragon's Den at the Intermediate School uh, half seven start it's five euro each and it's it's mixed tag rugby as uh, you know uh, uh, ladies and gents are more than welcome it's only a bit of fun mm. if you no experience is required at all Indeed, super so it was Cum Conway Luke O'Shea Dave Coffey all from Clodgan Rugby Club some great history there guys and I know and the best of luck and maybe we'll catch up in November for the 20 year anniversary we'll have plenty more after News at 7. Terrace Talk on Radio Kerry, brought to you in association with BrianJames.ie, leading the way for stylish menswear in Kerry. You're very welcome back to the second hour of Terrace Talk. Eamon Hickson here with you up until 8 o'clock. And coming up later on in the show, we'll be chatting Gaelic football and golf. But first, we're chatting Rally, and it's four days to the 40th edition of Rally of the Lakes, which takes place over the bank holiday weekend in Killarney, the cartel.e Rally of the Lakes 2019. And I have a few people in studio with me this evening to chat Rally. I have John Hickey, a local rally driver, Cormac Casey, event deputy clerk of the course, Pat Healy, another club stalwart, and and Mike Marshall, founding member of Clarny Di- and District Motor Club. Lads, you're very welcome to Terrace Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, might start with you, a founding member of the Clarny District Motor Club. We're co- looking forward to the 40th anniversary of the Rally of the Lakes. Where does it all start for yourself? Well, I suppose it all started with just one motor club in Kelly, the Kelly Motor Club. Mm. And it had members from north of the county and south of the county. So the Kelly Motor Club ran the first two Circuit of Kerry rallies. I was clerk of the course for those. And then we felt that there was more better rallying territory in the southern half of the country, of the county. So uh, the members from that part of the county split off from Kerry Motor Club and founded Killarney Motor Club. And obviously as a new motor club, uh, we wanted to have an event of our own. So we planned the first rally of the lake for uh, December uh, 1979. Uh, was it difficult at the time to get that going, you know, a new rally starting off? I suppose it had certain difficulties because it was at a time of the year when most budgets were spent, cars were being refurbished for the following year, championships were largely decided, and uh, a lot of the guest houses and uh, businesses that we would have been depending on for support uh, had closed down for the winter at that stage. So it was difficult to get it off the ground, but we had... Uh, a number of good things going for us in that we had great rallying territory, best rallying territory in the whole country, possibly one of the best in Europe. We had a wonderful supporter in the late Morris Redden of the Glen Eagle Hotel. Uh, the, the Glen Eagle Hotel is still with us to this day, 40 years on. And we had a team of enthusiasts who just simply wanted a rally of our own and to make it the best possible. 
Uh, Pat Healy, another club stalwart. Pat, what makes rallying Kerry so good? I suppose the enthusiasm of the of the people that are putting the rallies on. Um, as Mike said, the stages that we have, um, the people that are out there living on the stages uh, tolerate us. There's no problem whatsoever in closing the stages that we want to close from year to year. We go back to the same territory and um, they look after us very well. And indeed, I suppose as a lot of these areas have lost population, some of them have gained in population, so it hasn't changed. It's difficult enough, I suppose, to head into new territory, and we don't... We we try to move it around a bit and change the stages a little from one year to the next to give a particular area a break, but there are some stages that you just can't not use because they're like sudden anywhere else, like some Mall's Gap, Tim Healy Pass, Cod's Head, Ard Room. Those stages are iconic and um, I think they're the big, a very big part. Of course, the welcome in Killarney is a huge part of it as well, definitely. Cormac Casey, event deputy clerk of the course. Cormac, what, what does your job for the weekend entail, the uh, deputy clerk? Well, in my case, is I'm uh, second. I'm second to to Dermot, who is um, the the clerk of the course. Um, mainly just following up with Dermot, working with Dermot closely on safety plans, road books, um, time cards, and so on. And so on, just making sure that everything is organised well in advance, um, planning any um, issues that are going to come along the line to, to be able to deal with them and and uh, take care of them as they as they arrive. And again, dealing with um, the regulations, the sport, or the the stages, and so on, and so on. They all have to be developed well in advance. So the team is kind of put together probably nearly five six months ago. So it's been built up over the the coming months. And say so we're at the the peak of it now, and just getting it um, finally organised. And Pat Healy spoke about the the route maybe changing apart from a couple of the, the main the mainstays of the event every year. But one man who knows the track in the, the routes inside out should be John Hickey. John's a local rally driver. John, what makes the Rally of the Lakes so good for you as as the man in the seat in the hot Well, seat? I suppose definitely it is the terrain because the terrain in Kerry really I have done rallies up and down the country, but nothing equals the stages that we have around Killarney and in Kerry in general. And of course going south to Castletown Bear and Cod said in our groom and these stages are just absolutely incredible. So it's just it's just excellent. Even doing reconnaissance yesterday and the day before, it was again. No matter how many times you see, yeah. you see these stages, you you, you you still say to yourself, these have to be the best in the country. Where are you from originally? I'm from just outside Killarney, near Borodov. Oh, so you know the place as well. Oh, absolutely. And what do you drive, John? I have, um, well, the car I drive is actually quite unique to myself in the sense that I, I made it myself and it's a, it's a, it's something that I, I put together from a standing stat. So it's a, we, they call it the, the, the fans and the ditches call it the, the Fubaru because it's a Subaru and a Mark II Escort married together oh, yeah. to make a, a, it's the only one in the world that's a four wheel drive Mark II Escort and I use the Mark II Escort shell because it's synonymous with our Irish rallying and Irish fans and then I tried to make it into a slightly more modern hybrid car so it's quite interesting and When did that uh, hybrid I, 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 I done it in 2006 um, I suppose uh, how I actually dis- why I decided to do it in the first place was uh, the expense of competing was getting really ex- it, it was getting enormous really to provide yourself with a decent engine and provide yourself with enough power to compete against the opposition. So then I said uh, a stock Subaru have a 300 brake horsepower engine standard and it has a turbocharger and all these other components that I said I could definitely more certainly use to have a cheap, affordable, competitive rally car. Jesus. So, how long have you been driving that? Then? Uh, I've driven it since 2006. Yes, so I fabricated it up myself, and 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 we got it all together, and we got it homologated, and we got it. We we were allowed to run it, and thanks to Motorsport Ireland, really, and and it has been quite successful. So, and being a local man, there was no need for you even to do some reconnaissance yesterday. Sure, you know the place inside out, do you? Uh, yes, most certainly. Uh, I suppose doing reconnaissance does a. It's you still have to do reconnaissance. Uh, um, the gradient of roads changes and uh, surface changes, and is something that could be a very fast turn last year, uh, due to deterioration over the winter or whatever, could not be the same turn this year. So most certainly reconnaissance is important to be done every year. And so you went along yesterday with your co-driver. Who, who's your co-driver? My co-driver this year is my daughter, Michelle. It is going to be her first rally. She's just 16 years old with a couple of weeks. So she'll be probably one of the 
the youngest competitors ever to do an international rally. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, 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 it was a very interesting day. I had to stop several times on the first reconnaissance because she wanted to take photographs, if you don't mind, of the of the beautiful scenery. <laughs> I was just going to ask, how does the reconnaissance with, with your own daughter ahead of the Rally of the Lakes go? So well, it, it was very interesting, to be honest. <laughs> she impressed me more than, more than I thought she would. <laughs> Just as long as next weekend she doesn't want to stop for photos. <laughs> That's right. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. Uh, Mike, a uh, founding member of the Clarny and District Motor Club, this rally over the past couple of decades, it has grown from strength to strength. We mentioned about the terrain, maybe, and even the local support, but what else makes this rally so fantastic? Well, one of the things that ma- had a major influence on it was we moved from December to May. Mm. And... Uh, we got some inkling ahead of time of the new bank holiday in May and we applied to Motorsport Ireland for that date and everybody else thought we were mad. We couldn't see the reasoning behind it. Mm. But then when the bank holiday was announced, everybody saw the reasoning. And a bank holiday is important because the people who can afford to go rallying generally have jobs to go to on Monday. But if they have Monday to drive home, possibly all the way up to Donegal or to Belfast, well, it makes a big difference. Uh, Again, it's easier to run a rally in May. Uh, the championship is not yet decided. We're right in the middle of it. And more daylight hours. We don't have to get involved with running stages and darkness and so on. Yeah. So the move to May made a big difference. And I suppose every year we try to do something different. We try to push out the boundaries a little bit further. Sometimes we get away with it. More times we say, we're told you can't do that. But you never know unless you try. Mm. So we always try something new. Pat Ely, you have one of the toughest jobs, I think, over the weekend. Uh, the likes of John Hickey and a few others will be coming over Miles Gap at 100 miles an hour. You're the club safety officer. So what does your preparation entail? Well, I suppose this year, as John just neglected to mention there, Dermot didn't make life easier for the competitors because he has actually reversed half the rally mm. and ran it in the opposite direction to which it has run I'd say it only ran once or twice ever in that direction, but it meant that everybody had to do a recce, whether they knew the stages in the other direction or not, they had to go out and do a recce. Um, On the weekend of the rally, I suppose the safety aspects, number one, you're thinking of the safety of the competitor. Number two, you're thinking of the safety of the spectator. Number three, you're thinking of the safety of the residents along the stages and, uh, and, and, and to protect their property and that. So there's all sorts of things have to be done. Chicanes put into stages to slow people down. Um, areas where spectators can't stand to be clearly marked and marshals that are fully trained in in, in, in controlling junctions and that have to be put in place to make sure that everybody is in a safe place. After that, we have scrutineers that look at the cars, make sure that they are up to standard, examine the fire suits, the helmets and all that. That's all done on Friday. And by Saturday morning, hopefully everybody's in place, everybody's ready to go and we have a safe event basically. Lads, we're going to take a quick break. If you want to get in touch with the show, it's 66 216 Text or WhatsApp 083-300-3300 or find Terrace Talk on social media. We're chatting Rally of the Lakes with the lads here in the studio. We'll continue this chat after this short break. Terrace Talk on Radio Kerry. Brought to you in association with BrianJames.ie. Leading the way for stylish menswear in Kerry. Welcome back to Terrace Talk. Eamon Hickson here with you up until 8 o'clock. We're chatting rallying at the moment. Later on, we're going to chat Gillick football and golf. So if you want to get in touch via the usual channels, uh, call 712366 or text 083300. Here in the studio, chatting about the upcoming rally of the lakes with Mike Marshall, Pat Ely, Cormac Casey and John Hickey. Cormac, the event deputy clerk of the course, I suppose publicity and uh, I suppose getting the word out is a big part of the job as well. And you secured the, uh, I suppose, in Hollywood a lister, a local man for this year's event. Yeah, that was that was uh, that was quite enjoyable. Um, getting that uh, project up and running, and again, what it will do for for rallying and just uh, the the PR side of it is, is huge. Mm. And again, as I say, when we approached them, he jumped on board straight away. There was no um, there was no coaxing or anything like. That. He says once uh, once we made the offer to to come and join us for the weekend, he just jumped on board. So he initially started off as being um, event ambassador, and he, the more he thought about it, the the idea of driving and competing or participating on the event was was appealing. And again, he has a he's no stranger to motorsport. 
So yeah, again, what's his history in motorsport? It kind of came as a shock to many that Michael Fassbinder was going to be competing. Um, he did, yeah, but he has been... He competed in 2017 and early 2018 with um, Ferrari in the US um, Ferrari Challenge. And he's working with Porsche now at the moment on the Porsche um, Cup Series uh, in Germany. So we'll see him out and about um, later on in the year. Um, so he has, he's competing on a regular basis in the US as well uh, on a few series with uh, Tommy Burns, um, who's also attending the weekend, um, which will be quite interesting. Mm. Um, so yeah, he's, he's, um, he's definitely generating uh, public interest. Um, we have a ceremonial start where he'll be there on Friday night at 6.30 and then there'll be a QA and a in um, Scots afterwards. Um, so again, that'll be from a PR point of view and again bringing rallying into the, the into a, or creating a wider audience there is, is huge and is key for the sport. Like, there are so many other sports competing for our attention at the moment so we have to fight our corner. So I think this is doing it. And in recent years, I suppose, the support of the local community is massive in getting everybody on board. Huge. And the support um, from the community is is fantastic. And without without the community, as Pat says there, without the help of the, of the residents to be able to close the roads and even in the, the town with the council to be able to uh, use the car parks whenever we need them and so on. So the support is huge. Uh, John Hickey, message in here from Chris and Gunnifgilla. What are cars has John built that he will be competing at at the weekend? Have you built a number of cars? Uh, back along the years, I have done a few, yeah, just as different projects and so on, but just from an engineering perspective, we try to explore different avenues to see can we get things to work with, uh, without spending a lot of money, if we can at all, you know, and uh, yeah, some of them have worked, some of them have not, but uh, yeah, there will be a few of them competing. That uh, there is one there that we put together recently for uh, Shane Doyle. It's it's a, a little BMW using a 1600 engine because he's only allowed to use a 1600 engine until he has four events done to get his license upgraded from a, to get him the experience at driving a lower powered car. So that's working very well. He's couple of rallies done already with it, and he's really having good fun. Oh, fantastic, Mike. Uh, there are a lot of Kerry drivers involved in this. Can you tell us some of the the younger Kerry drivers, the up and coming ones, who we should be looking out for over the weekend? Do you know, to be quite honest, I can't tell you much about the younger drivers. Yeah. <laughs> because I've taken a step back from that side of it in recent years. I've concentrated mainly on the communications radio side. And whereas my wife, Noreen, who looks after membership and things like that, she would know all of them. But there's an awful lot of the younger drivers. And when they come to the door to get that license renewed, I have to ask her, who's he? <laughs> <laughs> because it's very it's embarrassing to have somebody talking to you. And knowing your name, and yeah. you don't know who they are, but, yeah. you know, they're all welcome because they're the future of the sport. In your 40 years, as was at Rally of the Lakes, you've seen a lot of fantastic drivers coming through the rally. Yeah. Who would be uh, f- some of the, the bigger ones, even in the, in the early days? Well, I was always a great admirer of Billy Coleman, because I knew him personally. Yeah. But uh, I suppose of all the great drivers that came, I would have the most respect for Bertie Fisher. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Because he was a very genuine person. Uh, any comment he ever made about a stage or suggesting that some change should be made to a stage was never made to create an advantage for himself but to genuinely improve the safety of the event. Yeah. He was a very genuine gentleman in that respect. Pat, you were nodding there at the mention of Bertie Fisher. What, what made him yeah. so great? Um, as Mike said, just the man, the, he was a... Well, number one, he was a pure gentleman and um, he, when he came down to the rally... Everyone was the same to him. He he didn't, he, he like he he was head and shoulders above most of the other people while he was competing. But he, he it never went to his head. He was just the same as anybody else. I remember going to Donegal one year, and uh, at the end of the Donegal, I was doing safety officer up there and being in the crowd outside the hotel. And my I had a little lad, my young fellow Rody was only about four years old, and he came over to where we were standing and took him in and sat him on the front of his car. And that. That's the type of thing he would do, you know. He was a pure gentleman. At his favourite stage, he told me once was, he called it Loch Cara. We call it Cara Lake oh, yeah. out in Kilorglin. He absolutely adored that stage. We're not using it this year, by the way, but um, no, um, a pure gentleman, in fairness. He would be the man that would stand out for me as well. Definitely. John Hickey, the local driver who's taking part this weekend, this is your 35th start on the rally, so we know you're out doing your recce yesterday and maybe had a few hairy moments uh, while the daughter wants to take a few photographs, but over the next few days, what are your final preparations going to be? Well, really, the car is the most important thing to be prepared. The car will have to be 100% because of the fact that it is an endurance rally more than a, a sprint event, so 
everything has to be checked and double checked and, and, and just make sure that, that it's fit for purpose. And of course, like Pat said earlier about safety and so on, it's absolutely paramount that everything is 100% safe and uh, you won't get through scrutiny unless the car is 100%. So everything just um, it's, it takes a good bit of time and it's quite meticulous but it just has to be done and uh, when you're preparing the car yourself I suppose you have that advantage in the sense that you have done all these checks yourself rather than depending on someone else to do Something that uh, it maybe it's put as a criticism against rally and sometimes the cost the expense isn't it, while not telling us exact figures is it an expensive game to get into? That's relative, really. It's relative to the category you're in, the class you're in, and what exactly, where you want to compete. Of course, if you want to go for overall honours, you're going to be competing with people that has uh, huge budgets. And of course, getting back to the late Bertie Fisher, one of the big advantages with Bertie Fisher was that he had the budget along with the talent. Mm -hmm. So he had everything you needed to to be successful. Now, not everyone has that. There are some very, very talented drivers that unfortunately doesn't have the budget or the access to the money. But... Within the Rally of the Lakes, there is 20 rallies, not just one, mm. because each individual class is a rally for the people that's participating in that class. Yeah. And, and, and th- th- this is what people uh, fail to see uh, lots of the times, that, that uh, each individual class is an individual rally. So I- I- if you can't afford to be in the bigger level, there's a level step down, step down, step down to what you can afford. So, and of course, if you're mechanical and if you're coming from an engineering background, it makes it even much easier and, 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 and much cheaper to participate because you don't have the bills for building or repairing the car or, or getting the car up to, up to, to specification. So in that regard, the rallying, can, it suits every budget and I suppose uh, varying skill levels as well? Yes, because clubman rallying really is a working man sport. It, you know, it, it's, it's different if you go on to more professional levels and so on, but like everything, unfortunately, uh, some people, the, the budget for some people might be... 20 times greater than the next guy, but he has a class that's relevant to his, what he has to spend. Uh, Cormac Casey, event deputy clerk, can you give us a kind of a rundown on the course over the weekend or the stages? Where is it starting and as we move on over the weekend, where does it culminate? Well, obviously the, the, the key start is using Miles Gap on Saturday morning and then we're heading down West End and doing um, our groom and Cod's Head, which is absolutely stunning, mm. as the guys have said already. It's just beautiful down there. And then we're doing the Healy Pass and centralised services down in Castletown Bear for um, the for the Saturday loop and back over Kilmacalogue then and home. And then on Sunday it's staying closer to town, we're doing Moz Gap again and Sheen River just down to Kinmare and back into Killarney then Nakashihan and Gurtnagan are done twice. So it's staying close to Killarney and service then is inside in um, Leapers Car Park for mm. the day. So again, there'll be a good buzz around there. There'll be a lot of people around. There'll be a lot of activity and so on, so on. And obviously, with uh, Michael Fassbender and so on, yeah. it'll be um, it'll be a pretty busy weekend. Indeed. And finally, I suppose, John, we'll go back to you. You're the man driving over the weekend. What are the what are the plans? What would you be happy with in terms of results? Oh, well, sure. We're always trying to aspire to the best result we possibly can. But in this particular event, it's just to, to get home is the, is the most important thing because it's an endurance, you know. So uh, I think uh, to finish this event is, is, is a huge achievement for everyone. And we'll take whatever result we get at the end of that. That's super. Lads, thank you very much for joining me. That was John Hickey, Mike Marshall, Pat Healy and Cormac. Casey chatting about the 40th Rally of the Lakes which is starting this weekend in Killarney and there's uh, loads of information online if you want to get in touch with anything there now we're going back to the naming of the pitch in Castle Island after late Giorgio Callaghan on Saturday prior to the official naming I had a chance to speak with acting principal of Castle Island ETB Teresa Lonergan I first asked her what does it mean for the local school to have such a facility on site it's a very special day for the school, the community, because this is not just uh, a pitch for the school, it's for the wider community, and I can see it being used for ye- in years and years to come. We've certainly benefited hugely already from it in terms of, obviously, for sports and training and all of that. But not only that, it's, it's the well-being of the students as well has been catered for hugely. And we've we just got news yesterday that we received our second amber flag for pos- promotion of positive me- mental health. So it's 
massive, huge benefit to the students all around in terms of training and lots of other activities. And there so, are a couple of hundred people here already and has even kicked off. I suppose it's great that it's, it's great advertising for people to come in and see what's available. Absolutely, it is. And it's great PR for us as well at the school because we are always we, we love to showcase our facilities from the school and this is just one other development in terms of our school in, in terms of improving facilities. Last year we got a brand new science lab and we're not going to stop there. It was constantly improving but the key focus all the time for us is teaching and learning. Every single improvement we do, whether it be in the school or outside the grounds or whatever, has to be focused on teaching and learning and this pitch is no different. It will have a focus on that as well. And finally Teresa, it's been named in honour of the founder of Castellan, the FC, Giorgio Callan and I know he passed away last year. I know he'd be very proud of this and he'd love to see it been, whatever it been named after but been provided for the, the people of Castle Island and the greater region. Yes, and Giorgio Callan, and I remember this time last year, God rest him, when he did pass away, the students, it was a huge, huge, huge impact on the school because Giorgio was, was a very key person in the school as well. He played a very significant role. Years ago he did training for us and whatever, and a lot of the students had lots and lots of different association with him. He did loads for Castle Island Soccer Club, as he did for our school as well. Yeah, so he was very involved with the school and he was a bit of a mentor to a lot of soccer players, even some who's going to take the field without here in Castle Island. Without a doubt. And even when students come in to us, you know, Georgie, he facilitated students going to soccer that would normally not have that opportunity. And he made that opportunity possible. And then when they came in to us in the school, they had that outlet. So that helped in the long, it helped us as well in terms of the whole positive behaviour and all of that aspect also, which is fantastic. Yeah. Teresa, thank you so much. You're more than welcome. And that was Teresa Lornigan uh, when I met her outside in Castle Island on a Saturday. And coming up after the break, we chat to the Zimbabwean woman who was awarded International Player of the Year in IT Tralee. And later on the show, we chat golf. That's all coming up after this short break. Terrace Talk on Radio Kerry. Brought to you in association with BrianJames.ie. Leading the way for stylish menswear in Kerry. Welcome back to Terrace Talk. I'm Eamon Hickson here with you up until 8 o'clock this evening. A few comments in after the Rally of the Lakes conversation. Mike called to say Georgie was a great man. If it wasn't for him, many clubs around the county wouldn't have gotten off the ground. We home a great lot in Kerry soccer. The ref refereeing the game between Temple Noe and Glenflesk over the weekend was excellent. He left the game run and it was lovely clean football. Well done to both teams and that ref. And if we could find out who that ref was, we might uh, check that one out and give him some credit. Wishing John and Michelle all the best in the rally. That was John Hickey and that's uh, came in from Jory Sheehan obviously John Hickey taking part in Rally of the Lakes over the weekend and best of luck to Shane McCarthy from Kinmare who will be co-driving in the rally and if you want to keep those texts coming in it's uh, 066 or text 083 300 300 Now in studio we're switching to Gaelic Games and I have uh, the IT Tralee International GA Player of the Year in studio and if I told you beforehand who I have in studio you'd be assuming it was someone along the lines of Louise Nimor Hurtig or Sarah Hulan, one of the, the usual Kerry Gaelic football names but it's actually a Zimbabwean woman Alessandro Alexan- Amber De Leo Amber or Zaza as you like to be known Welcome to Terrace Talk Thanks so much, Eamon. So, you're from Zimbabwe. So, and here we are in Tralee. <laughs> what brought you from Zimbabwe to Tralee? There was a marketing rep from IT Tralee and he came down to my little town of Vic Falls and it was just so strange. I think it was meant to be. So, a marketing rep from Tralee was in Zimbabwe? Yes. <laughs> and what were your first impressions when, when you were told about IT Tralee and the town of Tralee and even the county of Kerry? Uh... I heard that it rained lots in islands, <laughs> and I heard that the Guinness was good, yeah? And that's all I knew, really. And so when you decided to come to study, what you looked at whatever courses were available, and what are you studying at the moment? I'm studying veterinary bioscience, and it's one of the few places that offer it, and it's a really great course, so mm. that was the main reason. And uh, moving from Zimbabwe to Ireland, what kind of steps were involved? What obstacles were put in your way in terms... Did you have to get a, a visa to study or what's the, what was the process? Uh, yes, as a Zimbabwean, you do need a visa to study. So that is quite difficult and nerve-wracking to get. And what year are you in? First year. So in the first year. And when you before you came to Tralee, did you do any much research online? And I know you mentioned about it rains a lot. So maybe <laughs> the Guinness might be quite good. But... What were your first impressions when you got here? 
I didn't really have any impressions of it mm. because the marketing rep only came down towards the end of the year. So I only got accepted into the college about a month or two before it actually started. So I had about six weeks to pack up everything in Zimbabwe and come over. And were you studying in Zimbabwe prior to that? No, I was working there. Mm. And in terms of sport, so you come to Ireland and you hear about this game, <laughs> Gaelic football. Yeah. What, what was that like? What were your first impressions when you saw the game of Gaelic football? It was weird. Mm. I had never seen anything like it. I'd never heard of it before. And I just thought, well, I'm an island now. Might as well give it a shot. And what were the first few training sessions like? A disaster. The ball was flying everywhere. Those poor coaches. <laughs> yeah, there was not much coordination from any of us. But, yeah. And uh, so what sports had you played prior to that in Zimbabwe? I had played a lot of hockey, swimming, uh, polo cross and horse riding. Um, yeah, a fair few sports there. Yeah, so uh, those sports, they don't really lend themselves to Gaelic football. So no. <laughs> you end up, okay, maybe the first few training sessions were a little bit iffy, but <laughs> over time, did the skills come to you? Yeah, I mean, that was putting it mildly. The first few training sessions were very funny, <laughs> but... Yeah, it came and we did lots of practice and it was really great. The college was very patient, sending us all the coaches. And mm. yeah, over time, I mean, we didn't train for that long before we started going to competitions and that, but and it was good. I suppose if you're starting something new and maybe there's a little bit of frustration if things aren't working out, what made you stay at, stay playing Gaelic football? What made you persist with it? Because there are numerous other sports in IT truly that you could have switched to. I really enjoyed the game and I loved the fact that it was so Irish mm. and I thought I'm here, I might as well make the most of it and once you get the basic skills and you get excited because you can actually catch the ball and solo and <laughs> um, yeah, that just motivates you to keep going. And your first competitive game, so prior to that, tell me, what, what were you thinking before your first competitive game, playing a game of Gaelic football that a couple of months previous you'd never even heard of, never knew even existed? <laughs> I was very worried because we'd all been messing around on the pitch before and all our training sessions were, you know, very casual and I wasn't sure what to expect from an actual tournament and uh, how hard you could run at people and <laughs> when you could grab the ball. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was it was interesting, but and, it was really fun. And how did you perform in the first game? It was really good. I got player of the tournament. Oh, wow. Yeah. So a natural. <laughs> and what, what position in the field were you playing? I was forward. Hmm. Yeah, we were mixed teams, so there were double points of the girls scored. So oh, yeah. all of us were up front. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. So, so after you you played the first tournament, you got player of the tournament, which was fantastic. Did you continue training after that or did the season end then? Uh, I carried on training a bit, but then the season ended and we had all the Christmas holidays. Oh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. So to be nominated and then being awarded International GA Player of the Year in IT, truly, what was that like? What did that feel like? It was really surprising yeah. because when you're doing it, you don't, you know, you're just going to your training session and taking it day by day and you're not looking forward, you're not doing it for an award. Mm -hmm. So it was just a nice bonus on top of everything. Yeah. And who were the coaches that you had inside in IT Trilly? Uh, Eamon Fitzgerald, he was great. Um, he was the main guy and then there were two other guys from the college. Mm. And do you think it's a sport you're going to continue throughout the rest of your studies. I know you're just in finishing first year now in IT Tralee. Is Gaelic football a sport you think you're going to play for the rest of your time in IT Tralee? Yes, I think so. I spoke to Eamon the other day and he was really nice suggesting clubs to me and um, yeah, I would love to take it further. Or well, are you going to join a local club? Hopefully, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so the season is coming to an end. I know the college term is coming to an end. You have exams in the next few days in veterinary. Mm -hmm. When the exams finish, are you staying in Ireland for the summer? I'll go home. You go home? Yeah. And so when you come back in September, you'll come back fitter and stronger than ever, ready for an Gaelic football season? Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> and when you came to Ireland, you look and there was... <clears throat> Gaelic football, it's uh, one of our national sports. Are there any sports back in Zimbabwe, some local sports that maybe we haven't heard of? Uh, probably not. Mm. Um, 
I played a lot of hockey back home and that was a huge thing there, whereas here I've noticed field hockey mm. isn't such a big thing. So swimming as well, probably yeah. because of the weather here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, apart from that, it's, all the sports are very similar. So, and you mentioned hockey, you played a lot of it. Are Zimb- is it a very big sport in Zimbabwe? Is it the number one sport or where does uh, soccer fit in? Uh Hockey is a big sport, but I wouldn't say one of the main ones. Mm. It's more your cricket and your rugby, yeah. and swimming is huge. Soccer as well. We've got a good soccer team there. Yeah. And when you came to Ice Utrecht, I know you fitted in so well with the Gaelic football. Did you play any other sports while in Ice Utrecht? Yes, I played loads of sports. Um, when I came here, I knew no one. I had no friends, <laughs> and I thought. How do I make friends? Let me just join every club available. <laughs> and so, yeah, now I do judo and jiu-jitsu and boxing and athletics. And, Whoa. Yeah. And what uh, disciplines in athletics? Sprinting. Sprinting? Yes. And that lends very well to Gaelic football? Yes, it does. It and does. have you competed at sprinting with uh, with IT Trulli this year? Yes. Yeah. For IT Trulli, I've gone to the intervarsities in Athlone, the indoor and the outdoor. Oh, wow. And did you do well? No. <laughs> I tried, though. I tried. <laughs> You're international GM player of the year night each release, so I think that, that's enough. In terms of sport, what are your long-term plans with sport? Is it just going to be a hobby while you're here in Ireland or do you want to try push on, maybe start playing with a local club and maybe get move up the, the ladder in terms of Gaelic football in Kerry? Uh, yes, I would. I'd like to keep up the Gaelic football mostly. Um, I come from a very sporty family and one of us always has a sport on the go. So I think coming from that, it would be weird to go day to day not playing a sport. And what have your family thought of you coming to Ireland getting the International <laughs> GA Player of the Year? Did you first have to explain the sport to them? <laughs> yes, I, they still don't really understand it. Said it's kind of between soccer and rugby and a bit more strange but (laughs) have you any clips of yourself playing that you could send back to them Uh, yes I try but they just think I'm mad they really don't get it (laughs) you mentioned it's a very sporting family that you're part of what other sports do your family play Uh, so my dad cycles a lot Mm. my brother plays water polo and kayaks Uh, then my other brothers all play your usual suspects the rugby and the soccer and yeah and has Zimbabwe a strong rugby team Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. They do. N- yeah. And tell us about where you come from back in Zimbabwe. I know the, the capital, Harare. You're not close to the capital, are you? No. I live in a very little town called Victoria Falls, where there's the big waterfall. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. What's that like? <laughs> it's a little town, but it's beautiful. I had a great childhood there. Yeah. So. And tell uh, how many people, a couple of hundred people, and what are the main, what's, what do people do for a living there? Maybe tourism is a, a big part of it? Definitely tourism. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, what do your what are your family involved in? Uh, my family are involved in tourism, oh. and yeah, it's the main thing between the big waterfall and all the wildlife. Yeah. So. Oh could, wow. Yeah. And over the next few years now, you're is it a four year course in IT Trulli? Yes. So, tell us some of the the modules you've studied this uh, semester. This semester we've done anatomy, histology, your chemistry and bio and physics. And yeah, but they've been great. It's such a good course. And what's, what do you want to get out of it eventually? Before the course, I was working in conservation. Mm. And so I would like this to help me along the way. It's a good qualification to have. And is it something that you can do your four-year course here in Ireland, get your degree and go back to Zimbabwe and work, or work international. Is that something you'd like to do? Yes, it is. Yeah. And how big of a part will sport play? Not just Gaelic football, but what any other sport. How big a part will sport play in the rest of your life? Well, I, I've always been very sporty and wherever I've been, I've definitely made the most of it. So I think I would have to keep playing mm, some sport. Yeah. If I go back to Zimbabwe, there will be no Gaelic football, yeah. <laughs> but I'll pick up something else then. Well, look at it this way. You will be the best Gaelic footballer in Zimbabwe. This summer, so that's fantastic. <laughs> that's for sure. So when you come back in September, you'll be looking for some uh, some women's football club maybe around Tralee to join yeah. and maybe get, get training with them over the winter. Definitely. I would really like that. That's fantastic. Uh, that's Alexandra Amber DeLeo and affectionately known as Zaza. 
who was awarded the International GA Player of the Year in IT Tralee. You're very welcome. Uh, sorry, you're, uh, you were, it was great having you here on the show, as, as, uh, and maybe this time next year we might be chatting to you and you'll be after winning some more awards, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks so much, Eamon. We'll chat some more after this short break. Terrace Talk on Radio Kerry, brought to you in association with BrianJames.ie, leading the way for stylish menswear in Kerry. And you're welcome back to the final part of Terrace Talk. I'm Eamon Hickson here with you up until 8 o'clock. If you want to get in contact, text or WhatsApp 083300 or call 712366. Earlier on there in the show, we were chatting a lot about Giorgio Callan after a pitch being named after him in Castle Island. Got lots of texts and comments. We'll get to those before the end of the show. And we had rugby with Cloglin Rugby Club, who's a plan, who are planning a 20-year history later on this year in November. Now we're going to check golf, and I suppose golf was in the news over the past few weeks with Tiger Woods, uh, I suppose, comeback win in the Masters. And golf here in Kerry, it's been a fantastic couple of years. You know, we got some of the best golfers around, and we also have some of the best golf courses, and we also have some of the best golf coaches. And I suppose I have one of those in studio. He's a John Mitchell's man originally, James O'Dowd. James, you're very welcome to Terrace Talk. Thanks very much. James, golf in Kerry. How how is golf in Kerry at the moment? Would you consider are things strong? Well, I suppose the big golf courses are strong, but the smaller courses are struggling. And um, probably why I got into it to see could I get younger fellas to play golf mm. rather than likes of me who took up golf after playing football. So you know we're great at football and all that, but it'd be nice to have some great golfers too. Mm. So. And going with that, we have some of the best golf courses in the world. Uh, you see, in a almost a monthly basis, there's a survey of the top golf courses, and not just here in Kerry, all over Ireland, we get some of the best golf courses. But I suppose your thing is to try get the golfers to go with that. So you're in charge. You have the golf dock here in Tralee, and what's the aim? Is it to get young players back in playing the game? Yeah, definitely. The age of golf in not just Kerry, Ireland, is over the sixty mark. Mm. So there's no reason why we can't get them from schools to play golf like we are at other sports. So my aim is to get younger guys, boys and girls, to play golf. So we're mm. trying that, you know, in different ways like junior camps, school competitions, anything we can do really to help promote golf. And was it neglected over the past couple of decades? You know, you mentioned golf generally is an older person's game in recent, as was in recent decades. Was there a bit of a neglect in terms of trying to get young people into the game? Yeah, definitely. There was a slip up there. I suppose in the boom, people took up cycling and mm. other sports that you could just do when any time, really. Whereas golf was limited. And we do have the best golf courses, but they're not always the easiest to get onto. Mm. So I think it's getting trendier now, you know, Tiger Woods is back, yeah. everyone's wondering who Tiger Woods was a couple of years ago, <laughs> you know I'm obviously one of his big fans, but you know we have great golf in Kerry like the Springs families, you know Shukru's and Killarney's, you know the um, Higgins's in Waterville, so we do have a big history of golf it's mm. just, I think it needs to be revamped and pushed on. And James as part of being the golf doc when you get these younger children in, and you mentioned there are so many distractions, football, soccer, rugby, even gymnastics now is very big. There are so many different sports, and even there are other distractions outside of sport. What do you say, or how do you show the younger players that this is a fantastic game? Well, I suppose it's the only sport in the world that you can play with someone of any age. So, you know, you can go to any country anywhere in the world and play golf. I don't think you can do that in any other sport. And, you know, it is trendy now. You know, kids are enjoying golf and you don't have to play 18 holes, you can play six. Mm. And, you know, there's lots of places you can go and you can play with someone from six to 60. And, you know, that's the way to go, really. You, you wouldn't spend time with your kids otherwise. Some people say that maybe the cost involved in getting into golf is uh, prohibitive. Are there ways of playing golf that uh, maybe are not as expensive? Yeah, they are. And golf has got, uh, you know, there's a lot of places that you can get golf cheaper now. And equipment has got cheaper. And, you know, you, can, you don't have to buy everything in the one week. You know, you can build it up as you're going along. And, you know, um, there's lots of promotion out there, you know, for golf. And there's lots of ways of, of getting into golf that's not expensive. Mm. So, if you get it younger, it's cheaper, obviously. What are the challenges golf in Ireland faces in attracting a younger player? 
besides the weather. Besides the weather, yeah. <laughs> uh, I suppose um, getting into golf clubs is the main problem. I mean, we do have the big golf courses here, but it, they're very hard to get into. So I'm trying to get the smaller golf courses to take the junior guys and then build it from there. And obviously, that's cheaper there too than in the, the cheap, you know, the smaller golf courses. Do we have a high proportion of golf, clu- golf clubs in Kerry compared to the population size, or is it like this all over the country? No, no, we're definitely over golf courses. Mm. I hate the, the, the golf clubs will be saying, will you be quiet? Because we need them all. Yeah. But we don't, you know, we are struggling with some of the smaller golf courses. And that's probably because there are too many, really, mm. for the number of people in Kerry. You know, we probably have more golf courses in Kerry than Limerick and Cork together. Yeah. yeah. So, that, you know, there's a lot more people there. So, these young players... Finding a place for them to play is not going to be the issue, I suppose. The issue no, is just definitely not. making them enjoy it. And in terms of, of coaching, how, if you got a 7 or 8-year-old there, is that the, the age you'd start with? Yeah, definitely, yeah. I mean, I put up some videos there lately of 7-year-olds that were in the golf dock for the academy last week. And they were super. Mm. And, you know, they start that early. Why, why can't one of them be Tiger Woods? And where would you start with? Would you start with like gentle alterations to technique or are you are you worried that maybe you're giving them too much information at the start? Is there a balance to be struck there? Yeah, you've got to make it easy for them at the start. Keep it simple. Just get them to come up to have fun, mm. not to be a computer, you know. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the likes of Bubba Watson and all these people, they never got lessons, so oh. they did it their way. And they're working out all right. So, yeah. And in terms of, you mentioned Higgins down in Waterville. So David Higgins, would you try to use maybe a local example or or do you go for, in terms of a role model team for... Or well, you know, I mean, you have David Clifford's of today, mm. you know, who are up and coming and they're loving their golf and they're doing it because they saw somebody that they, you know, liked playing golf. So I'm really going with whoever they like mm. because we all have someone different. So we'll play with what they want just to get them, you know, just to get them into it. And some of them will come and go, but a lot of them might stay, hopefully. And this initiative you have, the golf talk, when did that all start? Um, I suppose a good friend of mine, Otto Spring. Mm. Um, well known in Kerry. Well golf. known in Kerry. Got me playing golf right-handed for a while and then left-handed, but um, it came through him. And, you know, a big motivator and very easy going and loved golf, loved life, and um, I probably took it from there. And what attracted you to the game of golf at the start? Um, well, I suppose it was a bit late for me. I kind of took it up when Kerry didn't want me for football, which was easy in those days because there were too many good fellas. But uh, uh, there was parts of Kerry that I didn't even know existed until I played golf. And they were all fabulous, like Bally Bunyan and Waterville. You know, anyone in the world would be delighted to play them. So I got into it from that point of view and never looked back. And... There has been some success for Kerry schools and young golfers in Kerry. I know in the schools Cobb Causeway were successful. Can you t- tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, that was a great little competition. I, I'm, I'm learning as I'm going along. I probably found out that it was a bit late in the school curriculum for the for the time to play it, and they wanted it like in October time, which I'm going to do now. But we had a great turnout, and um, we had a great day in Beaufort. So I held it in Beaufort in the middle of the county to help Mm -hmm. all the schools. So we had schools from Dingle and Tarbert and Causeway and Listowel and Tralee, and it was great to have them there for the first day. And it'll only get bigger and better. So that was the first year of it? First year of it. I don't think there was ever a schools cup competition in Kerry before. And I got help from Dick Spring, who sponsored a nice cup. And a great day, helped by the sunshine and helped by great help from Beaufort Golf Club as well. Oh, super. So when you get a little bit of local support, things just take off very easily. Yeah. uh, You know, all the schools that have been there wanted their names straight away for the next competition, which is great because we're doing something right. But we're hoping to build it to be a monster thing in time to come. And we've even got... Con- uh, people from America that would say would we be interested in doing a oh. father son competition mm. so you know it's you know our eyes are opening and we're learning every day but um, we're delighted with the progress so far mm. and uh, there is competition like we mentioned uh, football soccer and a variety of other sports 
So over the next year or so, do you want to go into the schools and I suppose just show the kids, say, look, this is something that maybe you might be interested in. And if, it does, if it's not for them, then they move on and play a different sport. Yeah, 100%. And I suppose the thing about it is, you know, the, we'll say the basketball season is only for so long and the football season is only for so long, but we can play golf all the year round. So we're not tying anybody down to a certain time of the year. You know, we'll work with them. But we are definitely trying to get into the schools and the schools are very helpful so we're delighted to move on it and hopefully that we can put it in their agenda for the following years. And as the golf talk, where do you operate out of? I operate out of um, uh, uh, Ballinorig. Hmm. It's just on the new bypass. Everyone will see it. It's like green netting on the side of the road. I think they thought it was a bike rally place at the start <laughs> but um, we are getting ready and we're only open a year and yeah. we're getting some signage done and um, we're getting we're getting there and it's it's great it's just starting and the hotels have just come on lately to, to, to only have realised that we're there so we're, you know it'll take a while but we're happy to work with it mm-hmm. we're happy to grow it and as part as the golf talk you are free to go all over the county as well and things if, if some school wants to get involved they can give you a shout and you'd head out to the school would you? Yeah we'd be delighted to do that and, and you know if there's a certain person they want to deal with we'd be delighted to help to do that mm-hmm. as well and hopefully in time that we'll get some of you know the up and coming golfers to go around to schools as well to get the younger fellas to uh, um, go with them. Would it be fair to say that there's kind of no one doing your role around the county? I know that some clubs, each golfing club might have their own professional at the club, but I suppose you're kind of unique whereas you're not affiliated to any one club. No, I, I'm not. And, um, you know, I'd be delighted if some of these clubs wanted to come on board. We'd work with them, of mm. course. But um, there was a, a company called DNL and who did a bit of... Um, uh, golf, but unfortunately the poor man died. And I know he has someone working with him, but we're not tied to anybody, so we're we're um, we're open to all, you know all movements of golf in any school, anywhere in the county. That's super, uh, James. Thank you very much for coming in this evening. That's great to kind of get a, a feel for uh, the uh, I suppose the underage coaching of golf in the county. And best luck with everything. And if if anyone wants to get in contact, it's out in Ballinorig. We can see your big green fences That's from the it. bypass. We'll have a big balloon up there soon. That's super, James O'Dowd. Thank you very much for that. And just before we finish up this evening, a few texts came in. Congrats to the stacks and well done at the weekend. That's Helen and Tralee. And in relation to that fantastic refereeing performance, uh, got a text here saying Paul Hayes from Kerns Rally was that ref in the Glenflesk and Temple Moor game. We know Paul very well, one of the best refs in the county. That's it for this evening. Thanks for listening in. Uh, we had Jill St. John Harrington on sound. Matthew sat in and produced for me this evening. While I sat in, Eamon Hickson for Tim Moynihan gave him a night off. So that's all for now. Thanks for listening. We'll be back this time next week and I think Tim, Tim Moynihan might take the reins again. Thanks very much. Have a great evening.